Hey, Wealth Warrior. Thanks for joining me as I interview Janine Finney, author of The Flip Flop CEO and Does the Shoe Fit? Janine is a classic baby boomer who started her network marketing business in her 50s after being a huge skeptic. So listen in as we have a great time having just a general conversation and share some tools, some techniques, and some business skills that I believe will change your life and your business. So Janine, welcome. I am so thrilled to have you here and super excited about the conversation we're going to have. Thank you. Me too. I am so excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, one of the things that I love so much about you and about your story is that in many ways, it parallels mine in having an initial negative blueprint regarding network marketing, MLM, whatever you want to call it. So talk to us a little bit about that. Like you're, you're, your pre-feelings about network marketing, and then we'll move into your story of how you ultimately became this huge champion of network marketing. Yes. Oh my gosh. I say that I was the biggest skeptic on the planet about network marketing, and now I'm the biggest cheerleader. So the reason for that is because 30 plus years ago, um, I had someone invite me over for dinner and um, I thought I was the only guest and I arrived and there were a bunch of cars parked out front. I went inside and it was one of those business opportunity meetings that people used to lie to you about. I mean, they were the network marketers were taught to lie and say whatever they needed to say to get you there. And I was so offended by that, that I just swore I wanted nothing to do with anybody that was involved in this business again. And I had a few opportunities along the, over the years of people bringing different things to me and I just refused to even listen. I was so negative. And so when Lori came home, so excited about finding out about this thing called network marketing and said, oh my gosh, mom, I know you've never heard of it or you would have told me because this is exactly what I'm looking for. And I'm like, yes, I have heard of it. Run the opposite direction. It is not what you think it is. You want nothing to do with those people. And I refuse to listen to anything. And she was shocked because you know, before that, I had always encouraged her to do anything. I was open minded and but I was completely closed and refused to even listen to anything new. So then what happened that created that shift for you? She obviously had signed up with the company and launched her business already. Yeah. OK. All right. So tell us what happened next. This yeah, is your Lori daughter- is Janine's daughter, by the way, in case you didn't catch that. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, Yes. A lot of people think, oh, so you saw her be successful and then you decided to get involved. No. Uh, For a year, Lori was, I, I love that Lori did not give her power away. She did not. She refused to accept what I was saying. She knew she was onto something. And so, um, yeah, I basically, uh, we were on a flight and we were coming back from Denver and I was bored and needed something to read. Lori had fallen asleep and she had this little book in her lap and I picked up the book and in 20 minutes, I went after a year of battling, I went from absolutely no way to, oh my gosh, I think I was born to do this business. And so when Lori woke up, she said, you know, I said, oh my gosh, Lori, let's, let's go, let's do this. And, um, (sighs) I mean, it was a total paradigm shift. So I know that that can happen for people if they take the time to to just be open to educating themselves. You know, I love that because my story is kind of the same. I had a very negative blueprint about network marketing, and it was based on a story that I made up as a kid when my uncle joined a network marketing company back in the 70s and came to my mom and my aunt his sisters and talk to them. And I just, all I can remember is like negativity and then trash talking him quite frankly behind his back. And it wasn't until probably, I don't know, seven or eight years ago when I finally asked my mom about it and said, Hey, I've been telling this story forever, but I've never actually asked you like, what was that about? And her whole thing was, Oh, well, I don't know that we were so negative about network marketing. I just, you know, I would, I can't even imagine myself as a salesperson and, and I would never be good at sales, which is a whole nother conversation, but it was funny, the stuff that we make up. And then, and so I carried that through forever 
just thinking, oh no, that's one of those things that you do if you can't get a real job. And then a similar thing, my husband flew with another pilot who introduced the concept to him. And I was initially, he was kind of like, huh, you know, maybe we should look at this. And, you know, the airline industry is forever turbulent pun intended, but you know, you're constantly, am I going to be furloughed? Am I going to have a job? Are we having pay cuts? What is the price of oil? What's going on in the Gulf? You know, all these different things that it's so dependent on. And so we had started looking, we were trying to divest ourselves of having all of our eggs in one basket because I work for the airline industry too. Um, and we were starting a family, which I ultimately left to stay home with my kids. But um, so we were kind of look, not kind of, we were looking at franchising, a lot of different things. And it was through the education process of letting down my guard, not telling anybody I was doing this because I did not want any outside opinions, any outside influence. And this was back in the 90s. So the internet wasn't out there. There weren't really books in the library on network marketing. I had to really work to find information and content about network marketing. And when I really opened my mind and did some research, research, um, it was amazing what I found. So yeah, you're right. It's just opening your mind. Well, and I think, you know, what people do naturally is they base their opinion on the people they're seeing doing, doing it. And that's the challenge because so many network marketers, first of all, don't know what they're doing. They're, it's the blind leading the blind a lot of times. And most, most of the time, they don't respect what they have. They, they don't really treat it like a real business. They don't really understand what it can, can create. And so, you know, it's just, that's what we're, that's what we're judging the whole profession on. And so, um, you know, it is, it is just my passion to bring clarity to this misunderstood topic and just get people to be open enough. I mean, it's not about trying to get people involved. It's just about, creating clarity, understanding what it is and what it isn't, and discernment, trying to, you know, um, break apart the, the people that are doing it from the actual business model. So it, it's a tough, it's very convoluted, and it's a tough thing to get to really get clarity about. You know, it's true. And it's kind of funny. One of the things that I'm working on myself, because I certainly do not have this mastered, but working on it within the profession is eliminating some of the vocabulary that we use. And you even said some of the words, I'm not picking on you, but you know, this is true. Um, we're not looking to get people in right. who wants to be gotten. So that word get, when I joined my company, join a company. No, you don't join a company. You sign up for a business. Um, you know, people, the way people are doing it, you know, I mean, there's so many things when we really think about the vocabulary, just even the vocabulary, a lot of the, the verbiage that we use is not the vocabulary that a professional business of any other kind uses. Right. And, and so I think part of our process is to educate. Absolutely. And what happens is it's like people, a lot of people, a lot of people that are successful were skeptics initially, never thought of themselves in be, as being in the business. But it's almost like what happens when people do become involved, they forget all of that. And, and all of a sudden, they are one of the ones that drank the Kool-Aid and they start talking that way and they start doing all these things. And it's, it's like they just completely forget it. Mm -hmm. So there's no resource. There's not a lot of resources for a novice. For someone that is just coming in and wants to evaluate this and treat this just like any other business opportunity that they would evaluate. Yeah, so true. So you signed up, launched your business with your daughter. How did you go about, uh, and maybe this is a story and maybe it isn't, but how did you go about, uh, I guess, redirecting your own mindset were you one of those that once your mind was opened, you didn't have any more negativity or did you still have things that you had to overcome? Tell us about that part of your journey. I had zero negativity. Once I really did this paradigm shift and, and understood the business model, I, I, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that I had found something like this, especially after having spent my whole uh, life up to that point, adult life as a single mom, many years working so hard and, and, and working by hard. I mean, 
you know, putting in the hours, putting in the time, making the sacrifices. So when I discovered this business model, I, I was just, I was blown away. And so I couldn't wait to jump in and apply what we had learned, what I had seen. And um, I just, I treated it just like I had gotten another, another job. Um, the career that I had been working for um, previously for 10 years, uh, the, the gal who owned the company sold it. And so I was left with nothing to show for my 10 years of hard work. And so I was even in a place where I was looking for something as Lori was, you know, also miserable. And that's why she thought, oh my gosh, we can do this together. But I did not perceive this business as being the things that I needed. I was looking for a way to create a six figure, match my six figure income. Um, I wanted to be able to do this on my own schedule. My husband's an entrepreneur, so he's always had freedom. And he was encouraging me to do something that I could do from anywhere, take off the amount of time that he wanted to take off. And I, I didn't see this as that. I saw this as like a little part-time thing that you can do and maybe make a couple hundred dollars a month, never perceiving it as a real um, choice for a profession. And so when I saw that it could be that, or at least it sure appeared to me to be logical and reasonable, I couldn't wait to jump in and apply it. And so I just, from day one, um, I drove Lori crazy because I'm a baby boomer. I'm a, my work ethic is probably off the charts. And she is uh, somebody who, oh my gosh, loves fun. Fun is her priority. I found out in college, she would she would pick all the fun things she wanted to do first, and then she'd plan her classes around the fun. So when she got out of uh, college and started working, she thought she could do the same thing. So um, we, it was a little interesting with us, you know, going on this journey together, but I was off and running because I had always done business development. I loved, you know, representing something that I believed in. And so we just really treated it like uh, a real job like this is you know what I'm doing now and you know we pretty quickly became successful within a year we had both earned um the company car and we had you know matched I had matched my corporate income Lori had much more than matched hers and we um you know it, it, it was just one of those things that I couldn't wait to tell everybody that I knew about it. So I had zero, zero negativity left. Okay. So I, I want to deviate for a sec. How much of your corporate business development skill set and mindset did you bring into at least that first year of driving hard? Probably a lot. And, and that's probably one of the biggest um, reasons that we were so successful. I was, I was very, um, accountable, very responsible, you know, to myself, um, I, I just really uh, took on the task just the way I would have if, if somebody had hired me to be their brand representative. And so I, you know, I really was very structured and, and with my time, you know, time management, I think is important. And, um, but the truth is, I could not sleep for the first year. I mean, I just jumped out of bed at, you know, 4.30 in the morning and just couldn't wait to talk to more people because I knew that if people that I had worked with in the past, I mean, I had the luxury of working with people and seeing what their work ethic was like, knowing people that, that have um, the ability to be successful. So I knew that if I could talk to them and get them to see what I saw, to, to apply what they were already applying to somebody else's dream and apply this instead to their own, um, I, you know, I, I thought that, that I would be successful. And um, what ended up happening though, and this is maybe another segue, but you know, that in, that's why we ended up writing books because what I discovered is that a lot of people felt the way I did. And I got a lot of people um, saying, you know, oh, this is one of those things. And so, you know, we just felt like Lori and I would just always walk away thinking somebody needs to be 
in their face, when they're saying you're not in one of those things, somebody should point out that, you know, what they're doing is crazy. They're the ones that are working for somebody else's dream. They're the one that, ones that are going to work in the dark, coming home in the dark, that won't have anything to show for their time after 10 years. And so that's, that's what led us to um, write our first book. And that is the perfect seg- segue into the book. But as a side note, if you're listening to this and you have somebody on your chicken list, I'm going to guarantee you that Janine is probably the character type that you might have on your chicken list. Already successful, six-figure income, corporate America, looks like the perfect person who's set, successful. And so you might have a hesitation to want to talk to somebody like Janine. Here's where I want to really encourage you. If you need to rewind this and listen again, she was not happy not happy in corporate America, not happy with what she was doing. She was looking, but she didn't know what she was looking for. She didn't know what she was looking for. And so those people who you think in the beginning or who are negative, like Janine, like me, we are the classic example of why you don't want to edit your list, why you do want to talk to everybody because you do not know what lies in their heart, what's going on in their brain, what's keeping them awake at night. And you might have the perfect gift to offer them in the form of an opportunity that will gift both of you. So I just had to throw that in there because I think it's so important to constantly drive that point home. What we see on the outside is not necessarily representative of what's going on in the inside and somebody else's inner struggles, bigger dreams, longing for more. Well, and and that's a great segue into something else that I'm really passionate about. I love that. I love that we're having this discussion because it's not something I've even thought about for a while. But what happens is in our business, we are usually taught a certain way to, to introduce the business. And a lot of companies encourage us to do it. Um, through the mission of the company, the products or whatever it is. And what Lori kept doing was telling me all about, you know, the mission of the company and all these things that, that were important to her. They were not important to me. I mean, I was looking for a way to match my six figure income, to have freedom and flexibility. And I, I had a specific list of things that I was looking for, and all she could do was keep telling me what she saw about the business. And that is what's so important. That's, again, why I'm such an advocate of um, using a tool that is going to address all of the things that might the person might be thinking. First of all, we have to be solution providers. We have to know what it is that the person needs a solution for and then offer that solution. It's so much in the way we present things. And people, it's like they don't, again, after they get into network marketing, they forget about what it was like before they got in. And I'm saying get in again. I'm using that bad language. Hey, I do it all the time. I do it all the time. I'm really working to catch myself, but. Yes, I appreciate that. I love that you're, I, I love that because I think we as a profession need to become more professional and we need to really um, speak differently and approach this differently and show up differently. And I, but I, I really do think that personally, I believe that there, we represent two things. We represent products and we represent a business. And to me, I'm not going to have the same conversation about those two things. And I may not even have the same conversation with someone. I'm, you know, I I just feel like that is one area that, that needs to be reviewed and evaluated. And basically if it's working for you and to do, to, you know, um, invite people to your business, the way that you're doing it and you're doing it through the, the mission of the company, then that's great. Then keep doing that. But for me and for our situation, that did not work. I believe that you can't go wrong if you are listening to somebody else's, um, what their needs are. And if you have a solution for something, then present it in those terms. You know, it's so true. I have a whole segment in my Street Smart Wealth Academy training, and I I always trained my own team when I was actively building a business. I I think this is so important because people always say, should I lead with the opportunity or do I lead with the product? And I'm like, neither. You lead with your prospect. 
it's just like what you're saying. What is their biggest challenge? Because it's kind of funny. You can take $100 worth of your product and a $100 bill and lay it on the table. Most of the, and you ask people to pick, most of the time they're going to pick the $100 bill because I think more people in their mind anyway struggle with money and money issues and all of that. Um, so I'm, I'm a big advocate of never leaving the opportunity side of it out. But it is important to know when that fits into the conversation and when you might fit it in too soon and blow it um, and lose maybe your best client, your best ambassador who ultimately will come around to build the business. But you are so right. You've got to lead with your prospect and what their biggest challenge is and what is the solution they're looking for. And I think another thing to, to mention is that the person that you are talking to has been watching you. They've seen the way you do the business. They've seen what, what that involves. And they're evaluating, do I want to do that? Could I see myself doing that? So that's why when I got started, I, I, I didn't want somebody to see me as the... Um, whatever lady, the product lady, um, because I knew that these were people from corporate America. These were people that were my peers and they, um, you know, that's not what they're going to want to do either. So I feel like I show up in every single situation based on the person. I wear my product lady hat. If I'm in a situation that that's appropriate, I wear my business I sell a virtual online franchise hat if I'm with somebody that that is going to be appropriate for. So I think it's really important to, again, everything that you said, just, but, but realize that we are examples. We are being examples all the time. And so I think it's important to be good examples. It is. And especially on social media, I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole because we could be on that all day, but people are watching you for sure. Yeah. Okay. So let's segue then into what you came up with as a solution to help explain and clear out the negativity that so many people have. You two wrote a book. So tell yeah. us about that and the journey and process. Yes. So the journey and process was very convoluted and very complicated, but what we were in a mastermind group and everybody in the mastermind group said, you guys have got to write a book. And we said, we don't want to write a book. I think we're the only people on the planet that did not want to write a book, but they kept saying, you know, there's different ways to do it. So we, we ended up um, writing the book. We knew exactly what we wanted it to be like. There were these books at the time. I don't know if you've ever heard of the series of books called Skinny Bitch. Oh, yeah. So the thing I about those, them, but I'm going to put it on my list. Yeah. Well, they're, they're, they were, gosh, from like 15 or so years ago. Both of my daughters got those books and on the cover is a stick figure, cool looking girl and it's called Skinny Bitch. And then there's a series, um, Bun in the Oven and all kinds of different, you know, versions. But my, both of my daughters read those books and were crying. They were just laying on the couch bawling. And I'm like, what is up with that? This book doesn't look like it would have anything that would make you cry. And what I learned after I talked to them is that the books are actually about veganism and cruelty to animals. And they actually did a really clever thing. They found, they, they attracted an audience that would never read about be, veganism and cruelty to animals. And they educated them about this. So they created more awareness about a topic that, you know, maybe this audience would have wanted to know about, but they didn't know they wanted to know about. So that book is what inspired the Flip Flop CEO. We wanted to write a book that would be cool on the outside, that somebody would actually read, a skeptic would actually read, and it would be written in a cool enough way, a sassy enough way that a skeptic would keep reading it. Because, you know, a lot of the books that are out there are for people that already drank the Kool-Aid. And we don't, again, we forget about that because now we're, you know, we've drank the Kool-Aid too, but we wanted to write a book that somebody that didn't like network marketing or didn't have an opinion or whatever would still enjoy reading. So um, the Flip Flop CEO is written to connect with smart, savvy, professional women. And it's written in a way that you want to read it. 
And so um, it basically calls out every single elephant in the room. I mean, you know, we don't know when we're talking to somebody, maybe, you know, my, my hang up was I did think it was a pyramid scheme. I thought that the person that sponsored my daughter was only interested in talking to me because she was going to make all this money. Well, I didn't understand that you can go around your sponsor. I didn't understand a lot of things like that about the business, but if that was my hang up and yours was, I'm not good at sales, then we still haven't, you know, solved the problem. So what we did was just really address all of the things in a really fun, fast way so that whoever you're talking to, whatever it is that they're skeptical about or their hang up is, we're going to address their concern. And so um, we wrote the books to be given to skeptics. We thought that, you know, if Lori had had a book and could have, it could have said, mom, it sounds like you're talking about something completely different than what I'm talking about. Would you read this? Just read the beginning of it and let's have a conversation. We could have saved a year of time. So we wrote the books believing that they would be used by network marketers to put in the hands of skeptics or the people when you come home after you've, you've joined a network marketing company and your husband or your mom or your sister or your neighbor's going, oh my gosh, you didn't fall for that. You could say, hey, read this. Maybe, I don't know. It seems like we're talking about different things. You could eliminate a lot of those situations. So that's why we wrote the books. That's ultimately not how the books have been used though. Well, we'll get to that. So you wrote the first book. And then you wrote a second book. So tell us about the second book. Yes. So the second book is a sequel. And basically um, what happened was after people read the first book, they said, oh my gosh, this is so different than I thought. This makes sense. But how would I know if I would be good at network marketing? I've always been a flight attendant or a realtor or a nurse. And so again, there was a missing piece in the books and the, and the resources that are available. There's nothing that speaks to someone coming in from a completely different traditional job to network marketing to really evaluate just like you would any other new change in career. So the does the shoe fit and it could be called does the flip flop fit because it's really to decide if you're you know made for flip flops. Um, basically it bridges the gap between traditional nine to fives and network marketing and makes it really easy for somebody to understand these are two different worlds. I mean, in so many ways, network marketing is complete opposite of what we've, we've been taught, you know, actually helping people instead of being worried about them taking your job from you, or, you know, there's just a lot of rules that are very different in the two worlds. And so does this shoe fit is really that book. And it's really also written for um, somebody that's gotten into network marketing and maybe is not achieving the success that they want to. It talks about the different things that we need to have. We need to have belief in the products, belief in the company, belief in network marketing and belief in ourselves. And a lot of times people are in the wrong network marketing company. They got brought in by what? a friend. What? <laughs> Did you really say that? I love you. Sorry. Keep going. And I'm not a proponent of like quit your company and go somewhere else because no matter where you go, there you are. You're going to take all your baggage with you. But it's very possible that you got into this without even uh, got into this. Oh, I'm going to wash my mouth out with soap when I get off of this. Call. We're just creating awareness. That's all we can do. Because like I said, I do the same thing. Yeah. So, um, I don't know. I had just sidetracked oh, myself. So get into network marketing and is it the right company? Yeah. yeah. So people, you know, a friend says, come on, we got to do this. And the friend doesn't even know what they're doing. And the friend doesn't, I mean, people typically do not have the respect for, for what they are holding in their hands. And if we started anything else, we would respect it. If we mortgaged our house to buy a franchise, we would never treat it the way we treat network marketing. And this is so much better in my opinion, because we're not risking so much. So that's my story. <laughs> Love it. It's good. And I know, you know, the next piece of our conversation is really going to be about how to use these books um, 
and and how they've not been used. And and before we get into that, I I just do want to say, I I know where we're going in terms of it's does, the first one especially is designed to be a tool to introduce people to the concept who have not yet decided to launch a business with network marketing um, to educate them what to look for and different things like that. However, I do still feel, and I know you feel this way too, Jenny, that it is a great tool. Even if you have gone ahead and said yes to network marketing, you could be like me. And still, I, when I finally you know, wrote the check, this was before you could sign up online, when I finally wrote the check and filled in the paper application and mailed it in, I'd love to tell you that my negative blueprint went away. It did not. It probably got stronger, to be honest. So that would have been a perfect book for me to say, or for somebody to say to me, understand how to explain network marketing, if nothing else. Because when you read this book and you educate yourself using it, it makes your positioning so much stronger, just even opening that conversation.